transformational things he had been teaching. They were still very human and very much in the world's way. So Jesus was providing them through a lot of repetition. If you read this section of John, you think, didn't he already say this? Yes. Many times he repeats these themes in this part of the, the record. The title today is, For the Love of God. When somebody said that to you, was that a good thing or a bad thing? Typically, we say that in frustration, do we not? When we don't know what else to say, when somebody's disappointed us or something didn't turn out the way we wanted it, we don't n normally give that as a blessing for the love of God. We normally say for the love of God. That's not a bad thing to think about. Among the last things Jesus told us is this great love that God has for us. So with those things in mind, let me turn now to the reading from the 15th chapter as we number them, beginning with verse 9 and ending with verse 17. Listen carefully as you hear these words. It is for us today the word of the Lord. Jesus said, As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants any longer, because a servant does not know what the master is doing. But I have called you friends, because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from my Father. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, so that the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. I am giving you these commands so that you may love one another. This is the word of God for the people of God. Be to God. Amen. Let us pray. We pray for this moment, Lord, on this day of celebration to stand again in a place where we can ask you to shine your light upon our lives, knowing that when you do so, you will find us wanting. We pray that we will take stock today of the ways in which you have made your love known to us. And admittedly, Lord, there is a gap between what we have received and what we are willing to give. So we pray today that you will help us be committed and convinced. And Lord, we pray that we will then begin to live more fully in the love that you have called us not only to receive but to share. It's a tall task. We pray by your grace and mercy that we are able. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. It's an interesting uh, reading God's word and looking at you. Or are you looking at me? I had a, an allegorical moment as I read the scripture. A stink bug was walking down the side of my Bible. Somehow I thought to myself, this is only right. <laughs> that my joy may be in you, and that your joy might be complete. One of the knocks on Christians is that we're not a very happy people. Is that true in your experience? No? <laughs> Thank you, Mackenzie. Yeah. You ask a question, you get an answer. Well, I won't argue with our young theologian, but it has been my experience is that there is uh, 
a sense of the solemn in people who know of God's grace that is not always transformed into the joy of the assurance of God's grace in our lives. In other words, I've known some Christians who are humbugs. In fact, quite a few. Trying really hard not to look in any one place in the room right now. (laughs) Every congregation that I've been a part of has had some people who were legendary in their ability to be humbugs. And that's a personality thing. They may be the kindest folk in the world. They may give you the shirt off of their back, as they say, but their public demeanor is one of gruffness and one of don't tread on me. And I'm suggesting to you today that when we read this scripture, all of us would say, I'm not as good at this as what I believe Jesus intended me to be. If you just need to think about that, mothers are a pretty good example in most of our lives. Maybe not all. But most of us will say we lived with a person or live with a person who is willing to put aside their own agendas, their own needs, their own hopes, and their own desires to see that the dreams and the hopes and the needs of their family and particularly their children are met. Is that true for you? Has that been your experience? I mean, God bless you. There are people who have had uh, an experience where the, the mother in their life or the mother figure in their life might have had all kinds of issues and it was hard for them to do what seems to come naturally for a mother. It's true. A mother will lay down their life for their child. You know this. It's true in the animal world. There is a deep bond between a child who comes into the world and that woman who was the way by which that child was formed and raised. And we're thankful for that imagery. God in his wisdom has chosen that relationship You know, we might have uh, come into the world many other ways. Lots of other critters in God's creation have a different experience. But this is what God chose. So to think about that as we celebrate a day that we simply uh, remember Mother's Day, we tend to think of love almost always in terms of how we feel our experience with other people, people who go out of their way to make sure that we know that we are loved, that we are cared for, that our needs are above their own. That forms a a very emotional relationship. Today we are going to ask you to think about love in a different way. As important as that emotional relationship is, we also want you to know that in a very large part, the kind of love of which Jesus speaks here may have an emotional component, but it is not an emotional response. It is a decision. It's a way we choose to live our lives and the way we encounter other people. And so today we'll give that a little bit of thought. Love is natural, but this kind of love is a choice. As I said, this section of John's Gospel is called the farewell discourse, if you want to uh, know the technical term. And as Jesus knew that the end of his life was coming near, he was making sure that he touched on the basics with his disciples. Never has it been more succinctly put in a few words than what Jesus says to his disciple here in this ninth verse of chapter 15. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in that love. That's... Nice talk. How do you do that? I don't know. Have you heard of the, uh, the principle called Occam's Razor? It comes up every few years I run into it. It's a, it's a phrase or it's an idea. It's a principle that is attributed to a 14th century English friar, William of Occam, who stated... And there's a great deal more to it, but this is how it's... Entities must not be multiplied beyond necessity. In other words, keep it simple. There was a earlier Greek principle that runs along the same lines. It says this, We consider it a good principle to explain, explain phenomena by the simplest hypothesis possible. Keep it simple. When Jesus is paring down his teachings, the last things he wanted to tell his disciples, 
He spoke of God's love. He spoke about the love that we experience from God and then the love that we are to give to others. This is among the most important things that Jesus has to say. It is Jesus' version of Occam's razor. However, religious life often runs counter to that principle. When I came to community church almost 10 years ago now, I have to... <laughs> I did that in love. <laughs> For those of you in the back who couldn't see, the stink bug reappeared right down Broadway. Okay. When I came to ch the church, there were many things in place here. And I have to admit, uh, this is a large congregation. And for a couple of years, all I was trying to do is figure out what had to be done next. I was running hard just to catch up, to stay in place. There was already in place a great deal of stuff here and I one of my Occam's razors uh, is if things are working well you shouldn't mess with them or what's how do we say that in the vernacular if it ain't broke don't fix it so a great deal of what was going on here at community church I had no reason or interest in changing the new member class curriculum is one Dr. Chris Livermore and and Dale Smith your previous pastors to my arrival here had put together this curriculum that we used for what we call class 101 how many of you have been in class 101 oh look at that isn't that great class 101 is a great place where we all get together and we kind of just generally talk about what we as a congregation believe what we think about God's purposes for us what we believe about the Bible we try to be pretty succinct. We used to do it in a Sunday afternoon or a Saturday afternoon in about four hours. It was grueling. Now we do it in eight weeks in about an hour and a half session each, and we still don't have enough time. From the very beginning until this most recent expression of Class 101, a part of what we teach there continues to be a focus for me. Essential number one in that lesson says this, the church is a family. Therefore, we strive to operate on the basis of relationship, not rules. A top priority in a fellowship of believers is harmony and unity. This is, I believe, foundational. There are, there are rules. The United Methodist Church has a thick book. It's called the Book of Discipline. And every four years, uh, elected officials from all over the world of other United Methodist congregations and conferences and districts come together. Next time, it'll be in Portland, Oregon uh, next year, next spring. And when that group comes together, they rewrite the Book of Discipline. There need to be rules. There need to be the ways by which we are organized and how we respond and all the legal responsibility. But that's not how we should govern our life. That's there as the backdrop. What is most important is that we care for one another in the most caring way that we can, that we are more concerned with a relationship than we are a regulation. Peter Woods, who is a United Methodist pastor, said in religion there is generally an obsession with obfuscation rather than simplification. And he makes his point by saying the Jewish legal code, code called the Talmud has 240 subject headings that spring from 10 commandments. Our propensity seems to be to become restrictive. Our propensity seems to be to want to interpret down to the details and the facts of what is accepted and what is not. I'm told that the Babylonian version of the Talmud stretches into multiple volumes and all that has come from ten simple commandments that we find in the book of Exodus. How contrasting then is this teaching of Jesus who condenses all religious observation down to one commandment. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this to lay down one's life for one's friend. This is a gut check for me. The way we're known in the community and the world should not be about who's in and who's out. It should be about how we can be engaged in the life of another person in a way that strengthens them.
in a way that supports them, in a way that cares for them, even when we are diametrically opposed on religious grounds or political grounds or social grounds. It does not dismiss us from caring for the person. The Uganda medical team was telling me last evening, some of them, that some of the medical mission they did was in a, in a predominantly Muslim area. And when they went in and cared for the people there, not asking whether they were Christian or Muslim, simply treating their diseases, simply treating their injuries, caring for their children, expressing to them genuine concern for the human being, they were surprised. In their view of the world, a Muslim cares for a Muslim, not for another. Many of those who professed being Muslims made a commitment to Christ simply as a result of the love expressed to them through this medical team that came into their place and invited them without any descriptors. Simply come, if you are in need, come and we'll deal with your need. They'll tell us more of those stories as time goes on. Larry Patton, a United Methodist pastor in California, said something a few years ago that I caught and remembered. There's a great deal of talk today about random acts of kindness. Are you familiar with that? Yeah, that's a nice idea. Random act of kindness. Jesus said, be specific and precise in your acts of love. There's nothing random about it. It is the predisposition of everyone who knows that God loves them and knows that God's love has been expressed in Jesus. As God has loved Christ and Christ has loved us, we are now to love others. That is Christ's commandment. If we are obedient to Christ, it changes the way we greet everyone we meet every day when we go out. Random is easy. When I feel like it, when the opportunity is easy, when I have the resources to do so, wouldn't it be nice to do something nice? That's not at all what Jesus said. It's not about convenience. It's not about when it works well for me. It's about engaging other people at the point of their need every opportunity we get. Precise acts of love should replace random acts of kindness. Followers of Jesus should be famous for their inclination toward relationships rather than rules. Followers of Jesus are called by Jesus to extend the love of God, the same love which, with which they are loved, that love now is shared with others. Not because it's natural or because it's easy, not because it feels good to do so, but because it is what Christ has proclaimed to us is the evidence that we understand. It's nice to have that warm feeling of affinity for another person. We like the way they act. We like the way they look. We like spending time with them. We like the way they respond to the things we offer to them. That emotional bond is a good one. It is what many of us remember most fondly about our mothers. But this love is a decision. It is a decision to extend to those around us at every opportunity, the love with which God has loved us. And we have seen that in Christ even to the point of laying down his life. It's not simply because it's the way that comes to us naturally. It is because Jesus has said, this is what you will do. For most of us, we have seen this selfless love in other people. The question is, as we receive that love, does it transform us? Do we begin to be the people in whom others see the grace and the love of God in our sharing with them? Unconditional love. The word in the Greek means a love that does not consider itself. It is a love that's solely focused on the other. It's for the love of God. Pray with me. Lord, we're thankful for the day that you've given us when we can once again ponder words that Jesus spoke. There were those who knew the sound of his voice, knew the touch of his hand. Lord, we know that there are those who were near enough to Jesus that they actually literally rub shoulders. But even among those who were nearest to them, to him, they were people in need of being instructed. 
There is distance now both in time and circumstance from those days when Jesus walked among us. But there is no distance in the things that he told us, that he taught us. So may we this morning wrestle as did those first disciples with how to allow that love expressed so fully in Christ to inhabit our lives and our choices so that as we move about the world in which we live, others will know of this love you have for us, which we share then with them. We thank you. And we're going to need your help. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.